Welcome to APC F4 study. Last time we looked at the first section of our English legal system, essential elements of the legal system topic. We looked at law and the legal system. So first of all today I'd like to do a little recap of what we learned last time and do a little bit of exam practice. As I said right back at the beginning in the introduction, the best way to prepare for this exam is to do practice questions. So I have set out a number of questions for you to have a go at. Um, they are all ones that fall within the section A exam examples. This particular part of the syllabus doesn't particularly lend itself very well to the more scenario based section B questions, but we will come along to them as we go through the syllabus. So we're going to have a go at some multiple choice examples from section A. They will either be worth one mark if there's three possible options, or they'll be worth two marks if there's four possible options for you to choose from. So what I'm going to do is set you the question, give you some time to have a think about your answer, go and look at your notes and try and work it out, and then we'll talk about the answers together shortly. So section one, question one, which of the following courts deal with civil law matters only? Is it A, the Crown Court? Is it B, the Magistrates Court? Or is it C, the County Court? So this question is asking you to find one court, one of these three possible answers, which is a court that deals with civil rather than criminal law matters only. So have a think about it, look through your notes and we'll debrief it shortly. Okay, so I've given you a couple of minutes to have a think about the answer to this question and to have a look at your notes. You hopefully have realised this is a question that calls on your knowledge of the two court structures that we looked at last time. So we had the diagram for the civil um, legal system and also for the criminal law legal system. So hopefully you will have remembered that um, looking at each of these in turn, the Crown Court is purely a function of the criminal law system. If you remember when we were looking at criminal law, cases either start life in the magistrate's court or they start life in the crown court. So on that basis, this is a criminal court too. And that will depend upon whether they are a summary, indictable or triable either way offence. So the answer here is the county court, option C. The county court is purely a civil law court. You won't find any criminal actions in this court. Okay, moving on to the second question. 
This question is worth two marks. Which of the following courts here appeals from the Magistrates' Court? Is it the County Court, the Crown Court or the High Court? And you have four options here. Is it A, 1 and 2, the County Court and the Crown Court? Is it B, 2 and 3, the Crown Court and the High Court? Or C, 1 and 3, the County Court and the High Court? Or is it D, all three of them, the County Court, the Crown Court and the High Court? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a think about that one. OK, so this is a slightly more complicated question, but it fundamentally still requires an understanding of those two separate distinct court systems and also the hierarchy of those as well. So looking at the question, we're talking about appeals. So we know we're talking about courts that are superior because a court will always appeal a case from an inferior court up to a superior court. As you remember, we go up the diagram that we looked at last time. And we also know from the question that we're talking about the magistrate's court, so that we know we're now we're in the realms of criminal law, because that's um, a function ordinarily of criminal law. So looking at our options in turn, you have the county court, the crown court, or the high court. Well, we already know, because we've just talked about it, that the county court is a court that purely operates in the civil law sphere. So immediately we know that the county court can't be the right option. So definitely not D, because that's all three of them. The county court is number one, so we definitely know it's not A, and C as well. So actually that only leaves us with B, which is the answer. You can appeal from the magistrate's court to the crown court or the high court. If you remember from our diagram, and again from what we just spoke about, Criminal cases will start life either in the Magistrates' Court, here, first of all, or they'll start life in the Crown Court. If they start life in the Magistrates' Court, you can appeal directly to the Crown Court, or if they start life in the Magistrates' Court, you can leapfrog the Crown Court and appeal directly to the High Court. So the answer is B, 2 and 3 in this instance. OK, moving on to the third question. This is a one mark question because there are three possible options. Which of the following is not a source of English law? It's really important when you're reading the questions to identify these key words. If you get your positives and negatives or masculine and feminine, that kind of thing mixed up, it's very, very easy to um, misjudge what you're being asked. So this question is asking us which of the following isn't a source of English law? OK, the options are A, custom, B, equity or C, public law. So I'll give you a couple of minutes just to have a look at that and work out your answer. <laughs> 
OK, you'll recall when we talked about sources of English law that one of the main sources of English law is case law, judicial precedent and judge-made law. And this case law develops into what we know as the common law. And that law sprung up through custom and usage. So we know from that that custom is a source of English law. It's basically common law. And you'll recall that we discussed the limitations of common law, the fact that um, you are awarded damages as of right under common law, but that damages is not always an appropriate remedy depending on the case before the courts, and that um, a separate type of law sprung up alongside common law to deal with the shortcomings of it, and that legal system was known as equity. So equity is also a source of English law, which means that the answer is C. Public law is not a source of English law. Public and private law are two types of English law which we distinguish between, but neither of them are actually sources of that law. OK, moving on to question number four. Which two of the following, which two of the following, remember to read the question properly, are private law actions? Are they those between individuals, those between business organisations, or those between individuals and the state. So you have to choose two. And the options are, is it A, one and two, so individuals and business organisations? Is it B, one and three, individuals and individuals and the state? Or is it C, two and three, business organisations and individuals and the state? OK, so the question is asking us which two of these are private law actions. So private law as distinct from public law. OK, hopefully you've had an opportunity to think about and uh, look back in your notes for the difference between the two. But private law basically governs actions as between individuals. So, for example, a contract dispute or perhaps a negligence action under tort. They are things between two people that no one else needs to get involved with. And also that applies to business organisations. So if you have a contractual relationship between businesses, that would still be a private law action, even, even though they are individuals. It's actions that are between individuals and the state, if you remember, that are what we consider to be public law actions. And that's usually criminal law because they're actions that are against society if you commit a crime. So on that basis, the two private law individuals, um, private law actions are one and two between individuals and business organisations. So the correct answer is A. OK, which of the following is the correct burden of proof in a criminal case? Is it A, it must be proved beyond reasonable doubt? Is it B? It must be proved on the balance of probabilities. Is it C? It must be proved beyond all reasonable doubt. 
or is it D, it must be proved beyond a shadow of a doubt? Right, you'll remember when we were talking about the differences between criminal law and civil law, that one of the main differences was this concept of the burden of proof. This is what you have to prove the defendant has done if you're going to succeed in your case. So, the burden of proof in a criminal case as opposed to a civil case is what we're being asked to identify here. Now you'll remember that because a criminal law action has the possibility of a prison sentence, i.e. it could deprive someone of their liberty, the burden of proof, what the prosecution has to prove in that case, is higher. It's a higher burden of proof in a criminal case. So that's the first thing we need to remember, because there's two, there's this beyond reasonable, beyond all reasonable doubt, or beyond a shadow of a doubt, and then there's on the balance of probabilities. And you've probably gathered from reading them that this balance of probabilities is a lower standard of proof. So that is not the right answer because that is the burden of proof, proof for a civil claim. It's a lower standard of proof to reflect the punishment um, that you may receive in a criminal case. So that leaves us with three more possible answers. And this is a very good example of a question where you have to know your wording quite specifically. So it's just a case of having revised this. So is it must be proved beyond reasonable doubt, be proved beyond all reasonable doubt, or be proved beyond a shadow of a doubt? So the way to look at this is while it's a higher burden of proof, it's not an absolute burden of proof. So the answer is A, it must be proved beyond reasonable doubt. C and D put a slightly higher burden of proof so neither of those are correct. It's important to, to learn a language of these kind of provisions. Okay, no, another question for you, last one before we move on to the next part of the syllabus. And this is it, which of the following is not a track for allocating a claim under civil law? Is it multi-track A? Is it B, single track? Is it C, small claims track? Or is it D, fast track? 
Okay, so you'll have identified from this question that we are in the realms of the civil law. And you'll recall that depending on the value and complexity of your case, the courts will allocate it to one of three tracks. And the first of those, and that's for claims under £10,000 and to basically last less than a day, is the small claims track. So that is definitely one of the tracks. If your claim is between 10 and £25,000, and again, is not too complicated, then the courts are likely to allocate it to the fast track. So that is also one of the tracks under the civil law system. The more complicated ones that are going to take up a lot of the court's time, that are higher in value and complexity and probably need expert evidence, will be allocated to the multi-track. So that's the third of our tracks under civil law. So in terms of finding out the answer, which is which of the following is not a track, the answer is B. There's no such thing as the single track in English civil law. OK, I hope that recap was helpful. We're now going to move on to the second part of our first syllabus area, essential elements of the legal system. and going to look at sources of law. Now, we looked at sources of law a little bit last time. We talked a little bit about case law and the development of the common law and how that all came about as a historical way of setting law in the United Kingdom. And the background to common law is this judge-made case law. And that, as we've talked about, is made under a basis of law called the doctrine of judicial precedent. Again, this stems from the word judiciary, judges, and precedent means it's a decision that has to be followed in the future. It sets a precedent. So judicial precedent came from this little Latin term that's in the notes, stereo decisis. And stereo decisis basically means when you have decided something, you have to stand by that decision. So that decision stands as a point of law going forward and therefore future courts are bound to follow that decision. There are limitations to the doctrine of judicial precedence, and there are three things that make a previous decision of a, of a judge, of a court, binding on future courts. And that is, first of all, whether the point of law that's being passed down forms either what's known as the ratio decidendi or the obiter dicta of the decision. That is the first way that a uh, decision may or may not be binding on future courts. It will also depend upon the hierarchy of the courts. So we talked about that a lot last time. We looked at the court system and we understood that we have inferior courts and then going up the diagrams they go to more superior courts with more uh, judges sitting and the principle of judicial precedent um, relies on this judicial hierarchy as to which courts are bound by uh, lower or higher courts and we're going to come on and have a little bit of a chat about that later. And the third thing that makes a decision binding or not is the facts of the cases. The facts have to be materially the same for them to be followed. If they're not materially the same, they, they can be called what is known as distinguished on the facts. So we're going to take each of these three in turn and just learn a little bit more about how it works. So the first is these two Latin phrases, which you do unfortunately need to learn. There's not an awful lot of Latin in this course, but you do need to learn ratio decidendi and obiter dicta. So what's the difference between the two? Well, if you ever get the opportunity to read a judgment, particularly of a high court, higher court such as the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal, you will see that um, in a lot of cases, these judgments are very wordy. They run to sometimes hundreds of pages, um, and that is because each of the judges in turn, and there could be three, there could be five, um, will take their opportunity to give the reason for their decision. They'll discuss the facts of the case. They'll look at previous case law and put it into the context of the facts in front of them. So it's not all of this judgment that becomes binding on a, um, a court in the future. It is only the reason for their decision, the point of law of the case that is binding. And this is what is the ratio decidendi of the case. So the point of law 
in all these pages and pages of judgment is the only part of it that will be binding on future courts. So what's the difference between ratio decidendi and obed dicta? Well, as well as this small point of law, you're also going to have a lot of other discussion by the judges. And that's essentially what obed dicta is. It's discussions of the law that don't actually form the judgment uh, about the points of law in question. So they're kind of hypothetical statements from time to time, perhaps discussing what the position might have been if the, uh, if the facts of the case had been different. And as a general rule, over to dicta statements are not binding. So that is how the two differ. But it's worth saying that over to dicta statements of well-respected judges sitting in a high court such as the Supreme Court can be very persuasive and will often be followed. A very good example of this we're going to come on and look at in the law of tort and it's a case called Donahue and Stevenson. The ratio decidendi of that case was um, groundbreaking, it's a very very important case for tort law but actually it was one of the obiter dicta statements of a judge called Lord Atkin that brought um, into law a very famous principle called the neighbour principle which we're going to talk about but it's just a very good example of how these obiter dicta by the way statements can actually become law even though they don't form the binding part of the judgment of the court. So that's the first element we have to look at when we're considering whether a precedent is binding or not. Whether the point of law forms the ratio decidendi or it's the obiter dicta and it's only the former that is generally the binding part. The second thing to look at is the hierarchy of the courts. So we've looked at this a little bit last time in terms of the structure, but this table basically sets out for you in a very neat way um, which courts bind each other and which decisions of lower courts are binding on it. So I started off at the top of this diagram with the highest court, our highest domestic court, which is the Supreme Court, but I've also popped in front of it the European Court of Justice because um, as we know, on European Union matters, the European Court of Justice um, is the highest authority. We're going to talk about that a little bit more detail later, so don't worry about that too much now. So on European Union law matters, the European Court of Justice is the highest authority. It is bound by nobody else. So it binds on that basis every court that goes beneath it. So if you remember on our diagram, it was at the top. So on European Union law, it binds all inferior English courts. The Supreme Court is bound by the European Court of Justice and itself. Now, I've put itself here and no longer binds itself here because um, the position changed, well, not that recently, in uh, 1966. So the historic position was that the Supreme Court was not able to depart from its previous decisions. Um, the 1966 practice statement means that that now isn't the case, but it's very, very rare that it happens. But it does bind all the domestic courts beneath it, from the Court of Appeal down to the Crown Court. The Court of Appeal is bound by the European Court of Justice and the Supreme Court. If you remember in the hierarchy, it was second beneath the Supreme Court. And it does, again, it usually binds itself. But as it says underneath here, there's been cases that have shown that you can overrule a decision of the Court of Appeal in civil law cases only uh, if it's been held that that decision was made in error. So if the judge was wrongly advised of the law and the court was decided on that basis, because it's a civil law we're talking about here, then it's possible that the Court of Appeal can overrule itself. So the Court of Appeal binds all of its inferior courts, so the High Court, County Court, Magistrates Court and Crown Court. The High Court and all of its divisions is bound by the European Court, the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal and the High Court does bind itself and it is binding on its inferior courts, so the Crown Court, the Magistrates Court and the County Court. <clears throat> the Crown Court, the Magistrates Court and the County Court 
are all very similar. They're all by, bound by the superior courts above them. They're bound by the decisions of the European Court of Justice on European Union law matters, remember. The Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal and the High Court. And it doesn't bind anybody, the Crown Court, the Magistrates Court or the County Court. They don't even bind themselves. So these are really the very, very inferior courts, these three here. So that's the hierarchy of the court, and it's very easy to learn by looking at those diagrams we looked at last time. Uh, just a little bit of terminology for you in this paragraph here. If a higher court doesn't follow the previous decision of a lower court, it overrules it. Please don't get this confused with an appeal. If a case is appealed to a higher court, and it comes to a different decision on exactly the same facts, it's known as reversing that decision. So it's just a slightly different bit of terminology there. Okay, the third way that a precedent, a judicial precedent, may not be binding is if the courts can distinguish it on the facts. So we talked about the fact that the case facts have to be materially the same. And if they're materially different, a judge does not have to follow them. So actually, if a judge doesn't particularly like a previous precedent, if he can fit his facts into this realm of being materially different, he can distinguish his case and therefore he would not have to follow this judicial precedent. So that, in a nutshell, is how judicial precedent works. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages of it, and actually some of the advantages um, are also disadvantages, so it depends upon which way you're looking at it. But it's felt that the system of judicial precedent allows the law to sort of ebb and flow and move with society. Um, on the flip side of that, it it's felt that it's quite limiting, that you're set to follow these precedents that the judges might not necessarily want. Um, it's definitely an advantage of judicial precedent that it's easier if you're a lawyer to advise your clients because you can look at what's happened in previous cases and give them a fairly good idea of where their case is going to come out. So that reason, it's said it leads to fairness and consistency. But on the flip side of that, because there are hundreds of cases heard each year, this mass of case law means that inconsistencies between judgments actually can arise. So while it is consistent, it's also inconsistent, if that makes sense. Um, I also mentioned about the fact that the judgment sometimes runs to hundreds of pages and actually it's quite difficult to pick out the ratio sometimes. This ratio decedendi is quite hard to, de to determine because some of the judgments can contradict each other. So those are basically the advantages and disadvantages of this very specific doctrine we have in the United Kingdom of judicial precedent, which forms, as we've discussed, part of the common law. So looking at sources of law, that's our first source of law, common law, case law, judicial precedent. And the second is legislation. Legislation it can also be called statutes and it basically means acts of our parliament and other legislation known as delegated or secondary legislation. legislation. So if you hear the term or in the exam you see legislation or statute or acts of parliament or delegated legislation, it all basically means the same thing. So Acts of Parliament, as the name sort of suggests, are made by our Parliament, which is, consists of three bodies. We have the House of Commons, where our elected MPs sit. Then we have the House of Lords. Um, we also have the Crown. So the Crown is basically our monarch, and the Crown actually forms part of Parliament. And Parliament, these three bodies that make it up, were always historically considered to be sovereign. And what that means is that it is considered, Parliament, to be the supreme legal authority in this country. And that's because even though the courts can sort of shape the law through judicial precedent, they can't overrule legislation. And that's very, very important. The judges, while they can interpret statute, they can't decide that it's um, wrong or um, decide it needs to be revoked or anything like that. And also Parliament itself cannot pass any act 
that you can't repeal, which means you can't um, take it out of circulation. This concept of sovereignty of Parliament has slightly been eroded um, by a few things recently. First of all is the United Kingdom's membership um, of the EU. So our position as a member state means we now have to um, ensure our laws are in line with the Treaty of Rome, which was the first treaty that set up the uh, membership of the European Union, but also anything that comes out of the Euro European Parliament, so directives that we are therefore required to, as a member state, put into law in our country. So that has slightly eroded the uh, doctrine of sovereignty of Parliament. And also in the United Kingdom, over the recent years, a lot of power has been devolved to um, Scotland and Wales. So the devolution of power basically means power that was centralised to government has been given to the governments of Scotland and Wales and they've got a certain amount of power given back to them that now the United Kingdom Parliament doesn't have. So it has again slightly eroded um, this sort of concept of national sovereignty and sovereignty of Parliament. And the third way that the sovereignty of Parliament has slightly diminished is because of the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act which um, is the United Kingdom's um, act that uh, enables that piece of legislation to be brought into force here. We're going to talk about the uh, Human Rights Act um, a bit later on in the course. Okay, so we talked about legislation, Acts of Parliament, and we're going to have a little bit of a look now at how an Act of Parliament is brought into law. So in the United Kingdom, an Act of Parliament has quite a long protracted process to go to, through before it can be, be made law. It starts life as what is known as a bill. So a bill can be proposed by the government itself or by a particular MP. An MP is a member of Parliament, so they are a democ democratically elected member of Parliament um, who represents a constituency, which is a part of the United Kingdom. So they can propose a bill, a member of parliament, or the government can also, which is known as a public bill. Um, bills don't necessarily go straight into the parliamentary process. They're often widely discussed. The um, government are quite keen to get feedback on proposed legislation. So they'll usually circulate bills um, to experts in the field and they'll uh, issue what's known as green or white papers, which are um, suggestions of, of gov future government policy. Um, so these green papers and white papers invite discussion and comments and they use that feedback that they receive um, following these consultations to make any changes before this bill is formally introduced into Parliament. This uh, diagram in your notes is a very very good example of this very convoluted passage of a bill through Parliament. This is from the Parliament website and you can either start a bill in the House of Commons, so it can either start life in the Commons, which is where the MPs sit, or it can, and it's more unusual, but a bill can start in the House of Lords alternatively. And it goes through five stages in each house. So whether it starts life in the House of Commons first, it will always go to the House of Lords afterwards um, and vice versa. So if it starts life in the House of Lords, it will go to the House of Commons afterwards for their consideration. So you have a first reading of the bill, which is basically when the title is read out, that's literally all that happens. Someone will stand up, read it out and sit down again and they'll then schedule um, a time for what's known as the second reading. Uh, in the second reading, the, the uh, members of Parliament, this is in the example if the House of Commons start the bill, will debate it. They'll have a review of all the provisions of it and the opposition, so the party, political party that's not in government, will have their opportunity to make any suggestions. They don't make any amendments to the bill at this stage, it's just purely debated and the comments are recorded and noted. So the third stage is the committee stage. In the committee stage, a particular group of MPs, a committee, will sit down and go through the bill clause by clause and they will discuss each of the clauses, make sure it all works and it's that particular committee at that stage who will vote on any changes that are made to the bill. 
and that's before it goes to the report stage which is the fourth stage and then it goes back to the whole house the whole house of commons or to the house of lords if it's at that stage and the whole house will further consider the bill in its new revised form and they'll amend it and debate any changes that have been made after the report stage there's what's known as a third reading where there's more debate more discussion but there's not usually any amendments at this stage there can be in the house of lords but it's unusual so once it's gone through this whole process for example in the house of commons these five stages and they've agreed everything they will pass it on to the house of lords and it goes through exactly the same process in the other house and then the um, alternative house will consider the changes that have been made by the one that's just looked at it and so you get this process that's kind of backwards and forwards until they finally agree on the text of the bill and that's known as parliamentary ping pong because it's like a ping pong ball going backwards and forwards between the two houses so it can take a long time for this to all happen and to be agreed but assuming that that happens once they've agreed all the contents of the bill, the bill can go to the crown, to the monarch, to the queen, and it gets royal assent. And once it gets royal assent, it becomes law. So that's why the crown is this third part of parliament. So that is an act of parliament. An act of parliament is primary legislation. We're also going to have a quick look now at secondary legislation. So due to the fact that these um, acts of parliaments take a long time to get heard, secondary legislation enables parliament to delegate some power to pass legislation to other bodies. So they will um, essentially free up their own time by passing things on via what's known as an, an enabling act. And delegated or secondary legislation primarily consists of, uh, first of all, statutory instruments. So statutory instruments are pieces of legislation that sit alongside Acts of Parliament. They're often the technical um, bits and nuts and bolts of an Act of Parliament. So they're passed on by the virtue of this enabling Act to the relevant government department that deals with it. So for example, if it's the Finance Act, that particular part of government will be responsible for drafting the statutory instruments that go alongside the Finance Act. So that frees up an awful lot of parliamentary time. The second piece of delegated legislation is known as orders in council. Orders in council are the domain of a court actually known as the Privy Council. The Privy Council basically advises the monarch, so currently the Queen, and looks at a lot of the constitutional law matters um, in the United Kingdom. They can pass laws, the Privy Council, and this is usually in times of emergency. So if you've got some kind of war issue or terrorism related emergencies, they can pass laws and they can do that um, particularly when Parliament is not in session because the UK Parliament has two holidays and um, obviously if they're not sitting, um, they can't pass laws. So the Privy Council has this right to do that. The third type of secondary legislation are known as bylaws. And bylaws are delegated powers to local government authorities in a particular area. So they're very limited in their scope. They're things like um, imposing parking restrictions on a particular street. Central government is not interested on knowing about that. It's too much detail. So that kind of um, small day-to-day -day nitty gritty law is passed on to local authorities by virtue of this delegated legislation known as bylaws. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of secondary legislation? Well as we've discussed it's uh, much more um, quick, you can get a lot more done, it's time saving and it frees up parliamentary time and also particularly in the case of the statutory instruments that are passed on to the relevant department that specialises in the area that they're looking at, it can get a larger degree of technical expertise than perhaps would be given to it if it was looked at by central government. However, because these bodies that have had this power delegated to them are not members of parliament who have been voted into power, there's this view that this is law that's being passed by bodies that are not democratically elected and that um, sometimes is seen as a big disadvantage of it. 
Um, there's also a lack of control from Parliament. Um, although they do have a few checks and balances on delegated legislation, there's not an awful lot of oversight over the process. And because there's so much of it, it's very difficult to properly scrutinise it because it's so fast paced and fast moving. In particular, in terms of checks and balances, the um, government has set up what's known as a Joint Committee on Statutory Instruments. So this Joint Committee looks at and reviews statutory instruments and makes sure that they not these bodies who are making them are not acting without outside of their power. Um, if there's anything they're not sure about, this Joint Committee can bring it to the attention of the House of Commons and they can then absolutely scrutinise the statutory instrument, make sure that um, the relevant government department isn't going beyond its powers in terms of what it's up to. And actually in terms of having some control, Parliament can basically take the power away at any time that it wants to. It can revoke the act that gave the power in the first place, this enabling act, and take that power away. And that basically gives um, quite a lot of control back to um, Parliament if they are unhappy with how things are progressing. So we've looked at the sources of law in that you have common law and case law. And we've looked at the things you need for judicial precedent, the ratio decidendi and obita dicta, remember those bits of Latin for your revision. We looked at the hierarchy of the courts and how important it is to understand which courts um, are inferior and which courts are superior and who and what is bound by which one. Um, so you can use the diagrams we looked at last time or those tables we looked at just now in terms of understanding that. And then we also looked at the fact that you need to make sure that your facts are materially the same if you want um, the judicial precedent rules to apply to a case. Um, and we also looked at the other source of law, the main other source of law in the United Kingdom, and that was this concept of our codified law. This is the stuff that's written down and is on the statute books. So we have Acts of Parliament passed by our Parliament, which consists of three bodies, the House of Commons, the House of Lords and the Crown. And the fact that uh, it's a long process to get a bill made into law, made into an Act of Parliament. So for that reason, the government has delegated some of its powers to other bodies uh, in the form of secondary legislation. And this frees up parliamentary time, enables a bit more expertise but on the flip side of that, it can be seen that it's law being made by undemocratic means. So um, we're going to have a look at statutory, statutory interpretation in the next lecture.